So we're continuing in our Regent Review, Unit 5, Physical Behavior of Matter. We're going to do things like phases of matter, changes of phase, substances, mixtures, solutions, etc., etc. So Unit 5, Physical Behavior of Matter. Right, so first, matter can be classified as a pure substance or a mixture of substances. And pure substance includes elements and compounds. Both are pure substances. And then a mixture can be either homogeneous, which is the same throughout, or heterogeneous, which is different throughout. Okay. Uh, elements cannot be separated. They're the simplest form. Compounds can only be separated chemically. Mixtures can be separated physically. Okay? Uh, based on size, polarity, density, boiling points, freezing points, but usually boiling points, and solubility. Right, the methods, right, solubility, we use filtration. You separate sand and salt by, you put it in water, the salt dissolves, the, sail, the sand doesn't, and then you just filter out the sand. Boiling points, you can separate things based on boiling points by distillation. Uh, density, more dense sinks. Size and, and or polarity are for different types of electrophoresis or uh, chromatography. All right, let's see. Okay, chemical or physical change. Physical change. could be a change in size or if we're talking about particles or a ch change in arrangement of particles. Okay, so phase changes are physical changes. Solid particles are packed tightly in an organized fashion. A rigid crystalline structure. That is solid. Liquid. Okay. Particles are mobile, but still can be held together by strong attraction. So they're still fairly close to one another. But they're attracted to one another. And guess the particles are far apart and moving quickly. Uh, More about solid liquid and gas. Solid. Liquid. Gas. Shape. Solid has a definite shape. Liquid takes on the shape of its container. So an indefinite shape. 
Gas also takes on the shape of its container. Volume. Solid has a definite volume. Liquid also has a definite volume. Cannot be compressed. A gas can be compressed. So it takes on the, sh the volume of its container. It expands to fill its container. Uh, intermolecular forces. In the solid, they're strong. In the liquid, they're kind of medium strong. Not as strong as in a solid. And in a gas, they are weak. Uh, heating curve, very important. Okay, so a heating curve. At the bottom we have time. As heat is added at a constant rate on the x-axis and temperature Same degrees Celsius on the y-axis. So you have a solid and you, and you add heat, it's going to heat up until it gets to a point where it stops heating up and then it'll keep a constant temperature for a little bit. And while it's doing that, it all turns into a liquid. That is melting. Then it begins heating up again while it's a liquid until it hits a certain temperature and then it stops heating up. That is vaporization or boiling. And then eventually all turns into a gas and that gas begins heating up again. This process is endothermic because it is absorbing heat. Now the temperature at which it melts is the melting point. The temperature at which it boils or vaporizes is the boiling point. For water, the melting point is zero degrees Celsius. The boiling point is a hundred degrees Celsius. Now, very important term to remember is average kinetic energy. And that is measured by temperature. So when temperature is changing, average kinetic energy is changing. So we look back at our heating curve. While it's a solid, here. And while it's a liquid, here. And while it's a gas, here. The temperature is changing, so the average kinetic energy is changing. While it's melting, here. And while it's boiling, vaporizing here, the temperature is not changing, so the average kinetic energy is constant, not changing. So while it's a solid, liquid, and a gas, the kinetic energy is increasing, the kinetic energy is increasing, the kinetic energy is increasing. While it's melting and vaporizing, the potential energy is increasing. The potential energy is increasing. Now the opposite is a cooling curve. Right? Still temp, but now in time while heat is being removed at a constant rate. So now the temperature is going to decrease. Say the gas temperature is going to decrease until it's starts turning into a liquid. Now it's a liquid. Temperature, temperature decreases until it starts turning into a solid. And now it's a solid. So we have gas, liquid, solid. Right? While it's a gas, the kinetic energy is decreasing. While it's a liquid, the kinetic energy is decreasing. While it's a solid, the kinetic energy is decreasing. Phase change from a gas to liquid. Condensation. phase change of a liquid to a solid, freezing, or solidification, right, becoming a solid. During both of those, the potential energy is decreasing. This entire thing is an 
exothermic process. It is giving off heat. Two other phase changes you need to know are sublimation. It's going from a solid directly to a gas. It's endothermic. Common example you have to remember is dry ice, carbon dioxide, goes from a solid directly to a gas. It undergoes sublimation. The other is deposition. It's the opposite of sublimation, a gas going directly to a solid, and that is exothermic. Remember how to use on table T your heat formulas. Q equals MC delta T. Q equals MHF. Q equals MHV. Q equals MC delta T is whenever temperature is changing because delta T is a change in temperature. The other two, Q equals MHF and Q equals MHV, are for phase changes. Oh. Are for phase changes. You have to remember that when you use those, your specific heat, the heat of fusion and heat of vaporization are all on table D. All right. Also have to remember how to use combined gas store. P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. Also have to remember that for these, we have to use our temperature in kelvins. All right, absolute temperature, kelvins. If you're given degrees Celsius, you need to convert to kelvin. Kelvin is equal to degrees Celsius plus 273. Degrees Celsius is equal to kelvins minus 273. So you go back and forth between the two of them. Okay, so the P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2 can help us see some of the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature of gases. Okay? Uh, the relationship between pressure and temperature is direct. Because as pressure goes up, temperature goes up. As pressure goes down, temperature goes down. And the graph of it would look like so. Okay. P is on top, T is on the bottom. P is on top, T is on the bottom. So the relationship between pressure and temperature is going to be the same as the relationship between volume and temperature. As volume goes up, temperature goes up. As temperature goes down, volume goes down. And the graph is the same. Okay, whether it's pressure or volume versus temperature, the graph is going to be the same. These are both direct relationships. Now the relationship between pressure and volume, they are next to each other. So as pressure goes up, volume goes down. As pressure goes down, volume goes up. That's an inverse relationship. And the graph is going to look kind of like so. Okay. Ideal gas. Ideal gas model ex is used to explain the behavior of gases. Okay. Now, the, for that, we use what's called the kinetic molecular theory, KMT. And that states that gas particles are in random motion. always moving in a straight line, no forces of attraction between gas particles, okay. no or negligible volume. Okay, the particles have no volume. The gas as a whole has volume, but the particles have no volume. 
and the collisions are elastic. That means no loss of energy when they collide or bump into each other. Now, real gases, now I think to remember, ideal gases don't exist, but real gases are most like ideal gases okay, when there's low pressure and high temperature. Okay. Low pressure, so they're not going to be close together. There won't be forces of attraction between them. And a high temperature because they're going to move faster. All right, talk about Avogadro's law. Okay, and that means when we have gases at the same temperature, pressure, and volume, they have the same number of particles. Remember, a particle could be a compound or an atom, depending on the type of gas. If we're talking carbon dioxide, the particle is a molecule. If we're talking hydrogen, the particle is a molecule. Right? If we're talking helium, the particle is an atom. Uh, larger particles, if they will have more mass for that same unit volume, but they'll always still have the same number of particles. Have to remember that heat is energy. And just like you learned in biology, diffusion, it flows from higher temperature substances to lower temperature substances. So heat always flows from high to low. Ah, uh, reminders about reference table vapor presser pressure table H all right there's this dotted line that never seems to come out well in copies at 101.3 kilopascals that is normal atmospheric pressure it's equal to one atmosphere the place where the external pressure crosses the line of this is going to be the boiling point so you can see that this 101.3 crosses the water curve at 100 degrees Celsius, because water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. All right, this also can show us that at 75 degrees Celsius, something like ethanoic acid has a vapor pressure of like 10, about 22 kilopascals. On here, the strongest intermolecular forces is going to be in something like ethanoic acid, because it has a higher boiling point. The weakest intermolecular forces can be seen in propanone because it has the lowest boiling point. But propanone, while it has the lowest boiling point, has the highest vapor pressure. So higher vapor pressure means lower boiling point. And the opposite is true. Lower vapor pressure is going to lead to a higher boiling point. Okay, getting to the end. Solutions. Okay, homogeneous mixture. Of a solute dissolved in a solvent. So we have salt water. Salt, NaCl, is the solute. Water is the solvent, and the salt water is the solution. SLN is an abbreviation for solution. 
Uh, we've got to remember like dissolves like. From an earlier review. Uh, got to think about solubility. Right? Solubility talks about how much will dissolve in a given substance. So if we look here on table G, up a little bit. Right, look here on table G. Now we can look at our solubility curves. Do remember solids curve up and gases curve down. And what this tells us that how many grams of solute dissolve in 100 grams of water at a given temperature. So if we're looking at potassium nitrate at 60 degrees Celsius, we get about 106 grams of potassium nitrate will dissolve into 100 grams of water at 60 degrees Celsius. So if there are 106 grams of potassium nitrate dissolved in water, up to 100 grams of water at 60 degrees Celsius. That's on the line, so that would be saturated. So on the line is saturated. If there's less than 106 grams of potassium nitrate dissolved in 100 grams of water, that would be unsaturated. So below the line is unsaturated. Okay? If we heat up potassium nitrate to over 60 degrees if we heat up water to over 60 degrees Celsius and dissolve in a whole lot of potassium nitrate, so let's say we'd manage to dissolve 120 grams of potassium nitrate in that 100 grams of water and then let it cool to 60 degrees Celsius, but that 120 grams still stays dissolved, it's above the line, that would be super saturated. Okay. Back down, we're also talking about concentration, which is deals with how much solute will dissolve in a solvent. Right? Concentration. The symbol for concentration are these double brackets. We use two things from table T for concentration. We used molarity, which is moles of solute per liters of solution and parts per million, which is mass of solute divided by mass of solution times one million, or ten to the sixth. Okay, colligative properties. Dissolving, adding a solute to a solvent, so let's talk adding salt to water, okay, add a solute to a solvent, makes the boiling point increase and the melting point decrease. And it depends on how many moles of particles there are in the solvent. So if we, add, if we compare adding the same amount of sugar sodium chloride and calcium chloride to water, the calcium chloride will increase the boiling point the most, the sugar will increase the boiling point the least, and the sodium chloride will be in between. Here's why. Sugar dissolves, but it does not dissociate. So for every sugar particle we add in the water, there's going to be only one particle. Sodium chloride will dissociate into two particles. Calcium chloride will dissociate into one, two, three particles. So the more particles it dissociates into, the greater the colligative properties, the greater the boiling point increase, and the greater the melting point decreases. Finally, oh, and oh, sorry, two more things. One, solubility guidelines. All right, when you need to decide if something is going to be soluble, we go to table F. Anything with a group 1 ion in the compound is always going to be soluble, with no exception. So these 
are always soluble with no exceptions. Halides, so like if we have hydrogen chloride, right, because chlorine is a halide, it will always be soluble. However, there's some exceptions. If you have silver chloride, it will not dissolve. Lead chloride will not dissolve. Uh, lead iodide will not dissolve. Sulfates are always soluble unless they're bonded with silver, calcium, strontium, etc., etc. Next to that, we have things that form insoluble compounds, and these always have exceptions. So carbonate is always going to form an insoluble compound unless it's bonded with a group 1 ion or ammonium, etc., etc. All right, finally, last but definitely not least, let's say you have hot water and you pour in a bunch of sugar so much that some of the sugar settles on the bottom. Right? A lot of the sugar dissolved, but there's some settled on the bottom. Stuff is actually happening. This is at equilibrium. And this is a physical, or this is a physical equilibrium. The rate is equal in equilibrium. So that means some of the sugar is constantly dissolving, and some of the sugar is constantly crystallizing or precipitating back out. So the rate of dissolving is equal to the rate of crystallization. All right, and finally, at long last, we are done. I will see you guys in school.